morning, church. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for getting up and worshiping with us this morning here at Tangwood Community Church. Welcome to our guests this morning. Grateful that you came out to worship with us today. And we want to welcome those who are watching us online this morning. We welcome you. I invite you to go to twrtimes.com where you can download listening guides to follow along with the message this morning. I need to make a number of quick announcements to you this morning. Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, church, there is a congregational meeting in the community room. That's Wednesday at 9 a.m. Church picnic. We have uh, several tickets that remain. I want to encourage you to stop by the back table back there and see Ruth Ann about getting tickets or Howard, Lowry, either one, and invite your neighbors and your friends to come out. They need a ticket to eat. If they don't want to come for dinner, then the, uh, the entertainment starts at 7, and we want to invite as many as you want to to that. The reason for the tickets are, if you hand out tickets, we need to know how many meals to order. So for however many tickets are gone, that's how many meals that we will order to be catered in. So if you have tickets left over and you don't give them out or you can't get them out, then bring them back to us so we're not counting those as meals that need to be ordered. All right, ladies' Bible study uh, starts February 22nd. Sign-up sheet is on the back table back there. This morning is Communion Sunday, so if you came in and you did not, is anybody that came in did not receive a communion cup from the back this morning? Raise your hand if you, if you need one. Okay, so everybody's got one. Good. All right. Uh, surveys, the church surveys. These are service surveys. They are on the back table back there. If you got one last week in your bulletin and you filled it out, you could drop it off either in the offering plate or at the welcome table. Uh, also, if you did not get one or you did not fill one out, please do so. Grab one off the back table back there, fill it out for us so we can get you plugged into a place of service. Also, Men's Book Club is tomorrow at 2 o'clock, okay? And that's in the community room. Men, 2 o'clock tomorrow in the community room. And uh, join us for that discussion and that fellowship as well. All right, now, last week we started something. Do you remember what we started? How many of you remember your memory verse from last week? Good. All right, let's say it together. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now this week, inside your bulletin on the front cover, you've got a new memory verse, Psalms 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can say that together, can't we? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm going to tell you, you're going to be amazed at how easy and how quickly you commit these scriptures to memory if you will join us in doing that. Every week we'll have a new memory verse. You work on it all week, we'll say it together the next Sunday. And God will fill our hearts and our minds with his word and change our minds to be thinking on things above instead of things below. Amen? Hey, let's get ready for worship this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Father, we're grateful for another opportunity to be together here as your people. Father, to gather together around our Father's feet and listen to his word being spoken into our hearts. Father, it's not just any word. I believe that you prepared a word for us today. And it is your desire, Father, for us to open our hearts and our minds to do the hard work of preparing ourselves to receive your word so that we'll not be hearers only, but we'll be doers of your word as well. So help us, Father, to do that today. Clear our hearts and our minds of any distraction. Let our affection and our attention be only upon you. And fill us today with your word that you have prepared for us. We'll give you a thanksgiving and praise for all that you accomplished in doing that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Worship team, come lead us this morning. Well, good morning, Tanglewood. Oh, y'all went to sleep since the pastor said, Repeat after me. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. All right, let's put it together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His Lord, at all times, his praise will continually be in my mouth. All right, let's end up and sing to God be the glory. To God be the glory.
Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Oh, be closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd, No. 
promises of Christ my King. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on.
So I gotta tell you this this morning, seeing how you've seen me fight with my fan. I'm standing outside my house this morning and my neighbors come by. They say, good morning, Pastor Bill. I say good morning to them. And they think I'm being spiritual and really meditating on the message this morning. When in essence, what I was doing was watching the squirrels because I had Vaseline my poles on my bird feeders trying to keep the squirrels out. <laughs> And it became a real drama, so yesterday and today, and it, it didn't work. The squirrel's still getting in my bird feeders. Anyway, <laughs> still, still eating my bird seeds. <laughs> you got to feed them all, that's right. <laughs> well, I bring that up because according to the Bureau of Standards in Washington, a dense fog covering seven city blocks to a depth of 100 feet is composed of less than one glass of water. The amount of water is divided into 60 billion tiny droplets, and yet when those minute particles settle over a city or over a countryside, they can literally blot out just about everything in sight. The reason I bring that up is to tell you that a lot of Christians live their life like that. A lot of Christians are being choked out by the fog of problems in their life. They're, they're struggling with issues, troubles that, that cloud their, their spirits and dampen their spirits, anxiety, turmoil, defeat, strangle their thought life and they're all the time being the things in life are, are hard to see because of this the, the good things in life are hard to see it, listen our lives are being choked out by these types of problems and the bible tells us that god did not intend for us to live that way it tells us that god has not given us a spirit of timidity but of power and of love and of discipline and with god we already know all things are possible in our life with God, we can find the wisdom we need to address the problems that we face in life and know how to handle them and know how to address them and to work through them. Now, over the next several weeks, uh, we're going to be talking about a sermon series called With God. And in that sermon series, it's my hope that you and I will discover that with God, we not only find the wisdom to handle our problems, but we find the help that we need. With God as our help and God as our hope, we can face all the personal challenges and difficulties of life that we have and come through them. Uh, we don't need to get bogged down in the troubles of this world because with God, he can help us work through them. Now, the, the fact of the matter is this. When it comes to problems, we all have problems. Everybody here has problems. I have problems and you have problems. We all struggle with problems. And, and, and there's different ways that people uh, work through their problems. For example... Uh, some people have adopted the mentality that, you know, it's just not safe to talk about the fact that you got problems because people then question your faith and question your spirituality. So, you know, I, yeah, I got problems. I just don't talk about those problems because I don't want people to know I have problems. Others have adopted the mentality that says, you know, the way to deal with your problems, just pray them away. You know, God will, God will work through it. You just pray them away. Other people will say, you know, well, if you just have enough faith and you got good doctrine, you can, uh, you can deal with the, the stresses, the problems, the disappointments in your life. Now, the problem with thinking this way about any of these lines of thinking is this, that when we begin to think about our spiritual life and our problems, we begin, begin to boil down our spiritual life by saying, well, the, the real focus of my spiritual life is, do I have problems or don't I have problems? How many problems do I have? How little problems do I have? And soon that becomes the focus instead of, in our Christian life, the focus being, how much like Jesus do I look like? How much like Jesus do I talk like or act like? Because in the Christian life, my, my goal is to look to Jesus as my Lord, my Master, my Savior, and my role model. My desire is to look like Him. God's desire, in fact, tells us that He works through all things for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, so that he can transform us into the image of his son. So it is God's goal to make us look like Jesus. It ought to be our goal to look like Jesus and not our goal to be focused on whether I got a lot of problems or little problems and what that says about my spirituality. Some people will do this. Some people will just bury their head in scripture, bury their head in prayer, and underneath that, uh, that tough exterior that they put on, that, that fake exterior, the painful problems still exist. The pain's still there. The hurt is still there. We just, try to, we just try to cover it up by acting spiritual or trying to look spiritual. And the, the fact is that, that that's a real problem because how do I deal with my problems? How do you and I get the wisdom we need to deal with the problems in life that we face? Because we're going to have them. 
Everybody is. So where do we get this wisdom? Well, wisdom comes from God. And that wisdom that God gives to us is imparted to us so that it can live through us and we can address our problems that way. If you got your Bibles this morning, I invite you to open them to the wisdom book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1. And I want to just look at a few verses there and then we're going to get on with it. Proverbs chapter 1 begins, uh, Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs, we'll talk about that in a minute. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel, to understand a proverb and enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Here's where we get the biblical uh, wisdom, the, the God's wisdom, to begin to confront issues and problems in our life. And, and God gives us his wisdom, but in order to use his wisdom, we've got to get into God's word. Now, the wisdom is, is, is seeing God's viewpoint. Wisdom is saying, all right, Lord, give me your viewpoint of, of this problem. Let me see this from your perspective, and let me handle this from your perspective as well. So I want to start a little bit negative and then go very positive. I want to talk to you about the problem that we have with some of the thinking that we do. Uh, wrong thinking about problems is this. There, there's, there's a few of them. Number one, it's wrong thinking to believe that once you become a Christian, all your problems go away. Now, I'm not really sure how that lie came about, but, uh, but people who peddle that, come to Jesus and all your problems will be gone, are liars. It, they didn't get that information from the Bible. God's word never said that, and it never promises that. In fact, uh, uh, Jesus himself said this. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Now, it's a giant leap for you and I to say, listen, well, that's a promise that God said he's going to overcome all my problems. That's not what it says. There's a big difference between a promise of victory and a promise of, 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 of erasing all your problems. Can I just tell you this morning, you can't have victory without a conflict. You, you, can't, you can't experience victory or overcoming something without having something to overcome. Not only is this wrong thinking, it's in fact a lie. And, uh, and people who, who say that kind of stuff or go around telling people, listen, you come to Jesus, all your problems will be gone. You're doing a huge injustice to people by peddling that kind of nonsense. It's not true. It's just flat out, flat out wrong. Another wrong thinking is, is wrong thinking to believe every problem that I ever face is discussed in the Bible. Now, let me be very clear. The Bible will give you the wisdom to face every problem. But every problem known to man is not addressed in the Bible. There is not a scripture verse for every single problem that man will face in, in this world. Uh, far too often, you and I can speak out of turn, out of order. And we can say things like, well, you know, the Bible says this about that. I'll tell you a funny story. I was talking to my doctor this week, and for a minute I was impressed. He was, he was telling me that my plan wasn't a good plan, that his plan was a better plan. And he began to tell me about the, uh, he said, doesn't the Bible say that you got to have good soil and put the seed in the good soil and then the, good, the seed will take root and it'll grow? And he said, doesn't the Bible say that you can't expect that seed to grow in a week? I said, no. I said, the Bible doesn't say that. But, it, <laughs> but he thought he was really being good about it. And I was impressed for a minute because he's not very religious. But he, but he was on a roll there for a minute talking about the Bible, the seed and the soil. The, the fact of the matter is that we've got to be careful. Because when we begin to say the Bible speaks to all these different things and it doesn't, that's not true. Uh, the fact of the matter is it's always good advice to look before you leap and it's always good advice to, to look before you speak. We need to go back to the Word of God and make sure what the Bible says so we're not making false claims about it. it it's always, uh, it, it's, uh, it's wrong thinking to believe also that having problems is a sign of spiritual immaturity. Oh, if I got problems, I must not be very spiritual. Well, that's not true. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, the spiritual maturity is not measured by how many or how few problems that we have. Uh, the, the fact is that we all experience problems. Did you know that when you got problems, you got problems because you happen to live in a fallen world where sin is present everywhere, and sin is the, is the main cause of our problems. 
So everybody's going to have problems in this world. And the fact of the matter is that the spiritual maturity is not measured by how many or how few problems we have. You and I can look at Scripture, we can see some of God's choicest vessels that he ever used. Guys like Job, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Paul, Peter. All of them had life full of troubles and problems in their lives. Having problems is just a part of life. It happens. It's also wrong to believe that exposure to biblical instruction alone will result in you having success over your problems or the removal of your problems. It, why is that true? Well, it's, that's, that's wrong thinking because <coughs> it's one thing to grow up in the Lord, and it's another thing uh, to, to, or to grow in the Lord. It's another thing to grow up in the Lord. Spiritual maturity is, is not equated with how many times I attend church or how many Bible studies I do or even how many scripture memory verses I have in, locked up in my mind. I know people, and you do too, people who have attended church all their life, went to Sunday school, Bible conferences, church camps, they've got worn out notebooks and, and, uh, and impressive Christian libraries, but they don't act a thing like what the Bible tells them they ought to act like. And so it's not true that simply being exposed to the Word of God will help me to resolve my problems. Listen, Jesus addressed this issue with a parable. Listen to what he said in uh, Matthew chapter 7. He said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the uh, streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew, beat against the house, and great was its fall. What was Jesus' point? His point was, listen, both these guys heard my words, but only one of them put them into practice. So exposure to God's word in itself does not produce spiritual maturity, and in fact, it will not solve one single problem in my life until I begin to hear the word of God and put it into practice in my life and my circumstances. Now, those are the wrong ways of thinking, but I want to talk to you this morning about the right thinking about Proverbs, where we're at today. In this wisdom book, Proverbs is known as the wisdom book of the Bible. And someone has well said, if you want to learn how to get along with God, then you read Psalms. If you want to know how to get along with people, you need to read Proverbs. Well, the book of Proverbs focuses on human character and conduct. And the purpose of this entire book of Proverbs is wise living. Wise living is equated or synonymous with godly living. We read Proverbs to learn how to live wisely or how to live godly. And uh, most of Proverbs, written by Solomon, we said, he's the wisest man who ever lived apart from Jesus. Solomon enjoyed great material wealth and uh, rich spiritual heritage passed down from his father David. Solomon's daily advice comes to us from someone who had problems just like you and I. But if you're familiar with Solomon, you know that when, David, uh, when Solomon became king of Israel, God came to Solomon and he said, whatever you want, whatever you ask me for, I will give to you. And Solomon asked God for wisdom. And God said, because you've asked me for wisdom, I'm going to bless you in a multiple other ways, but I'm going to give you wisdom. And he gave him great wisdom. And so this book of Proverbs is where we find the treasure of the priceless wisdom that God gave to Solomon to pass on to you and I. In this book, we are encouraged to see the benefits of studying Proverbs. He says it right off the bat in, in the first few verses, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equality, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Right away we see that, that Proverbs gives, explains to us that a person with wisdom has the expertise in godly living and such skillful living will bring about discipline and order in their life. So why do we study Proverbs? Well, we study Proverbs because in Proverbs, God's wisdom is given to us, and it gives us the ability to cope with life. Now, having said that, we, we gain God's wisdom from God himself through Proverbs. Who, God gave it to Solomon. Solomon passed it on to us. We begin to study that. We gain his wisdom. We learn how to handle our life and life problems, not only from God's view, but in a God-honoring way. And so our problems and Proverbs meet right here. We come to the Proverbs and we say, God, grant me your wisdom to deal with my problems. Proverbs will give us a look from life from God's view, and he gives us wisdom and instruction. It teaches us 
we begin to perceive the words of understanding. Now, if wisdom is looking at life from God's perspective, and then understanding is responding to life from God's perspective. So he says to us that we are receiving instruction. That word receive is a very interesting word. It's equated with plucking grapes. So the, the word idea here is that when I'm receiving instruction, I am to pluck the instruction and fill my basket full or to fill my mind with his instruction. Like grapes, I'm gathering it in. Uh, this will in turn, he says, produce in me prudence or knowledge. Now Solomon addresses the youth, but he puts no age limit on this. He tells us that wisdom is available to everybody. Somebody may say, well, if I go to Proverbs, I study Proverbs, I read Proverbs, I gain God's wisdom, how do I know when I actually have God's wisdom? How do I know that I've got that? Well, it's simple. We begin to model it. It reminds me of the story of General Stonewall Jackson and his famous Valley Campaign. Jackson's army found themselves on one side of the river, but they needed to be on the other side of the river, and so he went to his engineers, and, and he told them, he said, listen, I need you to plan to build a bridge and, uh, and get our stuff across to the other side. Then he went to the uh, wagon master, and he told the wagon master it was urgent that the wagon train and, and all their stuff get across the river as soon as possible. And so the wagon master started gathering all the logs, the rocks, the fence rails, everything he could find, and he built a bridge. And long before daylight, he came to the general, and he told him that, uh, that the wagon master said all the artillery and everything is already crossed on the other side of the river. Jackson said, well, what are the engineers doing? He said, I don't know. The best of my knowledge, they're still in their tent drawing up plans for a bridge. When we come to Proverbs, we're not just supposed to sit around and read it. We're supposed to do it. We've got to put it into practice. We don't just, we don't just sit around and, and soak it all in. We've got to practice what we read. Godly wisdom is intended to produce something in you and I. We don't just fill ourselves with it. We fill ourselves with it to model it, to use it. Then towards the end of Proverbs 1, Solomon changes the principle of wisdom into a person. It's very interesting what he does. He, he, uh, he describes wisdom as a woman. Listen to what he says in verses 20 and through 21. He's, he's, he describes wisdom as a woman crying out on the noisy, busy streets of the city. And he says, wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the opening of the gates the city, uh, in the city, she speaks her words. Solomon says, listen, wisdom is crying out to all of us. Wisdom is crying out for all of us. Don't be so busy with life that you don't learn how to handle life, that you don't learn how to address life from God's viewpoint in a God-honoring way. We learn that from him. God's wisdom is available to us every time we pick up the word of God. And, and but wisdom is funny because not that you would want to, but wisdom can be rejected. Wisdom can be, can be refused. And you might say, well, you know, listen, uh, who in the world would refuse wisdom? Well, we see this in verse 24 and 25. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would not Help, uh, would not have none of my rebuke. Our problem is not exposure to wisdom. Our problem is putting it into practice. Picking up the word of God, reading it, and applying it to our lives. Putting it into practice. Uh, when we have it at our disposal and we ignore it, when I say to God, you know what, I'm too busy to hear from you about wisdom. I'm too busy to see life from your viewpoint. I'm too busy to handle things in a God-honoring way. I've, I've got a plan. I've got my things. I, I'm doing my, my stuff. When we do that and we ignore it, it's as if we're walking right by the outstretched arm and the voice of wisdom calling out to us, and we're pushing it aside, saying, get out of the way. I've got, to, I've got my things to do. I've got my places to go. And the problem with that is when we reject wisdom, the results are always bitter. Listen to Solomon describe what happens when you and I reject wisdom. He says, this is what wisdom will do. I will also laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your terror comes. 
When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled full with their own feces. For the turning away of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Wow. That, that's tough. That's tough talk. He says, he says, listen, you might casually reject wisdom, but the results will be anything but casual if you do. Listen to what he says. When trouble comes, as they inevitably will for everyone, wisdom says, I'm going to mock you when that happens if you reject my wisdom. And wisdom laughing at disaster and calamity. You say, man, that really seems awful cruel. But really all he's saying to us is the wisdom that has been rejected will soon visit you, the rejector. And the problem is that you're going to be reminded that you could have handled it different. Well, listen, here's, what, here's the bottom line we need to see. When we sit here week after week, day after day, month after month, year after year, and choose not to follow the wisdom of God and the wisdom of his word, we can expect some discomfort in our lives. And as one person said, God doesn't offer any panic packages of wisdom that can instantly resolve your problems when you, that we get ourselves into because we've rejected his wisdom. In fact, it, it, the Bible teaches us, listen, if you're going to change course, if you've been rejecting wisdom for a long time and you got yourself in a pickle, let me tell you, it's going to take a careful diet, a, a strenuous exercise to shape up our soured situations and distorted values. Now, you and I would certainly, certainly not be anybody who would reject wisdom, but we would say to ourselves, well, who in the world would be so foolish as to reject wisdom? Well, he tells us in verse 21, there are three kinds of people in the world that reject God's wisdom. At first, what he says is the simple which is another word for the gullible, if you will. They're, they're easily influenced. He tells us earlier that these people don't lack, they, they lack discernment. Proverbs 7 tells us that these people are easily enticed because of the lack of understanding. He tells us that these people never learn from their mistakes. In Psalms 22, or Proverbs 22, he says, the simple keep going and suffer for it. In Proverbs 1, 4, he tells us they lack good judgment and they're unable to look beyond the surface. The, the, listen, these people are... Those who follow the trends, they're easily influenced by other people. They will not put the work into thinking for themselves. They just go with the flow. Wherever the crowd is going, that's where they're going. Whatever the crowd is doing, that's what they're doing. If, if it looks good to everybody else, it looks good to them. But then he talks about a second group of people. Solomon says the second group of people that reject my wisdom are scoffers. A scoffer is one who turns aside, is, is one who uh, mocks or rejects or vigorously contempts, uh, shows contempt or shows disdain, if you will. Uh, the scoffer does not agree to disagree. The scoffer is making it their life's goal to argue, to ridicule, and to oppose. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but you probably know some people like that. It, it, you know, it, is their, it is their life mission to argue about everything. And you can't tell them anything. Well, that's what a scoffer is. They are, they're driven this way. Listen, wisdom warns us against trying to deal with these people. Listen to what Proverbs 9 says. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, he'll love you. These people are, have unteachable spirits, an unteachable attitude, they are the, uh, the, the they, when somebody corrects them, they return that with hatred and anger and, uh, and lash out with insulting verbal abuses. The, the, the scoffer is, a, is hardened in his ways. He's, he's not going to change. Listen, there's, there's no amount of counsel, there's no amount of biblical truth that's going to penetrate or get into them. So a scoffer is always going to reject the wisdom of God. There's a third group that he talks about, the fool. Now, when you and I talk about fools, we think about people who are just dumb, but that's not what the word fool means here. Uh, the fool is a person who does not lack mental power, they just misuse their mental power by wrong reasoning. And the perfect example of the fool in the Bible is found in Psalms 14 and verse 1. This is the best example. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This, uh, uh, what, what Proverbs tells us about the fool is this, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, or the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Uh, a fool also carries with it the idea of an evildoer or an evil person. So these kinds of people are the kinds that reject the, the wisdom of God. And, and there might be just a little bit of each one of these three in us sometime. We've got to be careful that there's not. Uh, this, these are the kinds of people who reject wisdom, but uh, what about those of us who want wisdom? What about those of us here today who say, you know what, Pastor, what I want, when I've got problems, I want God's wisdom. I want to know what God says about it. I want to know what, how God sees it and what would be a God-honoring way to work through it. Well, these, uh, the, you can be wise, and, and we can know these people. Uh, those who receive wisdom... Solomon says, become wise. Now, who are they? Well, Solomon uses 186 different characters to portray wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And out of all of them, one stands out the best, and it's found in verse 5. He calls him the wise man. Who is the wise man? Well, he says, he tells us a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man is a man of understanding and will attain wise counsel. So, who is a wise person? If I want God's wisdom, how do I get it and what, what do I become? Well, a wise person is a listener. That's what he says. This, unfortunately, this has become a lost art today. Everybody wants to be heard, but nobody wants to hear. And that's what he's saying to us here. A wise person listens. He secondly he says, a wise person desires to learn and to grow. What is so sad about our world today is that many of us equate wisdom and knowledge and learning to school. And when we get out of school, we're done with all that. We say, well, I've learned all I can learn. Now I'm just going to go about my business and try to apply whatever I've learned to life. That's very unfortunate because the fact of the matter is that we miss opportunities to broaden our horizons, to continue to learn, to broaden our minds, and to, and to grow. Did you know that learning ought to be a lifetime project? Every day... There is something to learn. You ever, you ever heard the old expression, oh, I can go to bed now because I learned something new today. You know, we ought to be learning something new every day. Every day is a learning experience for us. He says the wise person is a listener. The wise person is a learner. They're, they are a grower, and, and they keep on learning. And he says the wise person seeks and accepts wise counsel. A wise person doesn't sit around saying, I know it all, and I can do it all. A wise person sits around and says, I know I don't know it all, and I know I can't do it all. And, and Solomon says that they, that they seek wise counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. Wise men and wise women just don't go around asking anybody for advice. They use discernment to gain their wisdom and to accept wise counsel. We, too, can be wise men and wise women. We, too, can tap into the wisdom that God gave to Solomon and have it for us and use it in our life. And that brings me to this. I just want to finish with this. There is a definite relationship between God's wisdom and problems. And I just want to say three simple things to this issue. The first one is this. We all need to do a checkup on a regular basis. Because before godly wisdom can enter into our hearts and our minds and be used in our life to resolve problems and solve problems, we got to go back and deal with, Lord, is there any simpleness in me? Is there any uh, scoffing that exists in my life? Is there any foolishness in me? Because if there's any of those three things, if I've got any portion of that going on in my life, those things have to be addressed and removed before God's wisdom can enter in to my mind, and my heart, and my life. And only after addressing these issues can we then begin to practice applying God's wisdom to our problems. And then finally, with God's help, you and I can regularly and effectively apply God's wisdom into our lives, helping us to view and handle our problems with wisdom and understanding in a God-honoring way. And that's what we want to do. That's what you and I want to do. I want to turn to God's book of wisdom, I want to read it, understand it, and know how to apply it in my life. So as believers, we don't have to live our lives in a fog. We don't have to be choked out by the cares of the world because God hasn't given us a, a, a spirit of, of fear or timidity. He has given to us a, the power and love and discipline 
that we can live our lives for his glory. And it is with God that I find the wisdom I need to handle and face every problem that I will face in my life as I apply God's wisdom to it, seeing it from his viewpoint, and doing it in a manner that honors him. How can I find it? I find it in his word. How can I find it? I find it in reading and studying Proverbs. And there's a New Testament book that is called the Wisdom Book of the New Testament. It's a book of James. James is the wisdom book of the New Testament, and in that book we find this wonderful promise to us. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. So with God's help, he promises when I ask for his wisdom, he will grant me his wisdom, and he will help me to find his wisdom if I will do the work of asking him for it. Let's do that this morning. Let's be wise people. Realize that we need God's help and God's wisdom to see life from his viewpoint and to handle problems in our lives in a God-honoring way. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the wisdom that you granted to Solomon that he passed on to us in this book of Proverbs that we could turn to, Father, and have wisdom and understanding and know, Father, how to address life from your viewpoint and know how to handle things that come our way in a God-honoring way. And so, Father, this morning we, we turn to you and we seek your help. Help us, Lord, to read, to study, to understand, and to apply your words of wisdom into our life so we can see life from your perspective and handle things in our lives in a God-honoring way. We give you praise, honor, and glory for what you do in our life for doing that. In Christ's name, amen. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray with me together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You'll get yourselves ready at this time. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. As we do that, this is a time of self-reflection, a time where we look over our lives and we ask the Lord, Father, is there anything within me that is displeasing to you, anything within me that I need to be cleansed and purified of? And Father, if that is, I confess those things to you right now, and I ask you, Father, to honor your word, which says that when we confess our sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. Jesus is meeting with his disciples in the upper room, the Last Supper. Paul, writing to the Corinthians about what he received from the Lord, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll take your cup, tear off the top of the wafer. Father, we give you thanksgiving and praise this morning. As we come before you and we take this wafer, Father, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, not only his death, burial, and resurrection, but Lord, we remember that he is coming again. He is alive and living today. And we thank you, Father, for this bread as a remembrance, not only of what he did, but what he has yet to do. We give you thanksgiving for it in Christ's name. Amen. Paul said in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you'll take your cup, peel back that side. Father, again, coming to you today, receiving this juice as a remembrance, Father, of the blood that Jesus shed, the sacrifice that he paid, so that we might have the, only the forgiveness of sin, but also the gift of eternal life. We thank you, Father, as we look back at the cross. And again, we thank you and we rejoice that Jesus, through his death, 
sought our pardon. And through his resurrection, he gave to us life. And we look forward to that living Savior returning to earth to gather his own to himself. So we thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. stand and sing, may we? we have as we leave this place today we leave knowing that we can tap into the very wisdom that Solomon was given by God and use it for us as we go out and negotiate our way through life out here meeting our friends and neighbors and working our way through this community we have the wisdom that we need to learn to be Jesus to all those that we meet but don't just be Jesus to them don't let them just see Jesus in you make sure you invite them to know the Jesus you know and to come to him like you did. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you back here next Sunday. Have a great week.